get started. All right, let me pray for us and we will return to studying more. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come back here and join together um, to study your word and gospel of Mark. Thank you for the short break that we could have. I pray that it was a refreshing time for all of us, and I pray that we would be eager to jump back into your word. Um, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, that you would help our hearts be tenderhearted to receive the wisdom that you have given to us here. Not just receive wisdom, but to receive uh, salvation that comes from you alone. Um, so thank you for your precious sacrifice mm -hmm. on the cross. Thank you for the precious blood that has been spilled for our eternal life and our joy and future glory. Um, we give all glory and all honor and praise unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So it's been a couple weeks. Um, I will start off with this. Okay. So <laughs> these are the rewards for the class. The red is how many points you guys have collected as a class, okay? So I said this before, Christianity is a team sport. You do not win alone. Um, even if you are alone, the Holy Spirit is with you, okay? So you guys got 71 points as a class, right? So the way I'm scoring this is every time you get a quiz question right, I'm only scoring question one because it's multiple choice. The others are kind of like reflective, right? Uh, I'm not going to be like, oh, you didn't mention Jesus, so you get a point on now. Um, so if you guys get quiz point quiz question one correct, you get one point, okay? There's about 14 of you, and we've done five classes. So you guys have been doing pretty well. Um, and then for some of the homeworks that I've asked you to turn in, those are bonus points. So specifically Mark 2, some of you turned in Mark 3. I didn't ask you to do that, but I, I gave you points anyways. Um, so if you guys get perfect score on the rest of the quizzes, uh, it'll bring you up to about 127, okay? Uh, you need 150 points for reward number one, 160 for two, and 175 for reward number three. So you guys, there's a little bit of, of room left, um, but do not fret. There is an opportunity, okay? So I'm going to ask for another turn-in homework on Mark 7. Uh, so that'll be like another 14 points or so. And I guess you get like 140-ish, right? And then there's another homework for today, which you have the best ability to get unlimited points, okay? Um, so uh, just just uh, encouragement there. Um, but uh, what are the rewards? So I, I thought hard about what would be an exciting reward for you guys. Um, unfortunately, I don't have much to offer you. So I don't know if these will be exciting or not, but uh, I'll list three rewards and then we'll vote on them. Whichever one gets to be reward one, two, and three, you guys can choose. Um, Okay, so one of the rewards is we will get you guys boba or your drink of choice uh, at one of the classes, okay? Um, pretty good, I don't know, you know, $6 each. <laughs> um, reward number two is like a food party, okay? It can be a picnic, it can be at our house. Uh, we'll invite you guys over probably after the class is done uh, and we'll eat good food. Um, and maybe it'll be better depending on how many points you guys get. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, reward number three is I will take a razor, maybe like one or 0.5, depending on what my life, wife will let me, and I will shave my head. Uh, okay. So let, let's vote. Um, okay. Boba, food, razor. Which one do you guys want to be reward number one? Show of hands. Uh, and for those of you online, uh, please, um, I don't know, speak? Are you on Zoom? Raise your hand. Um, can you raise your hand? Is it easy to receive raised hands online? Okay, okay, I see two, two participants raise their hands. Okay, okay. All right, so let's do this. Boba, how many people want that to be reward number one? No one. All right, cool. What about food? Reward number one? I see a couple hands. Okay, four, five, six. <laughs> Uh, I think that's two online. Is that two online? No, no. Six. Okay. No, Esther and I voted for the boba as number one. Okay, okay. Two, two, six, and then razor. No one. Ah, oh, thank you. Because Esther. I want to be motivated. Esther wants it. Esther wants it. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, okay. So it looks like food will be reward number one. Okay. What about reward number two? Oh, yes, they do stack. So if you get reward two, you also get reward one. 
Oh, Sorry, yeah. that was not clear. Yeah. Okay, okay. Food, uh, food number one, boba. For number two, four, five, shave, head, razor. Ah, <laughs> oh, you guys are so kind to me. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so we'll do food, boba, and then razor. All right. Uh, let's see if you guys can get to reward three. We'll see. Um, <laughs> it'll be it'll give me a good excuse to talk to my coworkers. I'll be like, why, why are you coming with that shaved head? And I'll be like, oh, let me tell you why. Um, anyways, okay. So you guys have a clear vision of what's ahead, right? 71 points right now. 127 if you ace all the quizzes. And then you need like eh, 30 more from the homeworks, okay? All right. Um, okay, speaking of which, quiz link for today, please take a moment to open that up. Um, and then before we dive in, here is your first opportunity for bonus points. Does anyone want to uh, share the verses that they memorized? Anyone? You don't have to. Two points. <laughs> The verse that you did, or somebody else's verse that you remember? Uh, all of them. Oh. <clears throat> yeah? Sure. Okay. All right, let's go. I just, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was a reference. I just don't remember. Okay, that's okay. That's okay. I know they're both from First Peter. Okay. Um, Olivia did First Peter 2, 5 through 7. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, the ESV version is because he is a idol. Okay. He did not revile in return, and he threatened his second. Oh, oh, I don't like saying threats out loud. It's okay, it's okay. Maybe I'll pass and, and practice. But. Okay, that sounded right to me. Anyone else want to take a stab? Oh, yeah? Okay. Acts 22, 16. That was very close. Okay. Um, and now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized, and wash away your sins. Calling on his name. And is, that, then, is that it? Is that, that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. great. <laughs> and then the one that I chose was Proverbs. I forget the chapter. Was it Proverbs 20? Four? It's not 4 23. Oh, yeah, Proverbs 4 23. Okay. Um, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Nice. All right. Cool. Two points. One point. Three points. All right. Good job, guys. Anyone else? No? Sure. Keep going. I memorized one, but I didn't memorize somebody else's. Okay. I did 1 Corinthians 10 15. Okay. My confession is always for me, but such as the promise of man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond where you're able, but with the temptation, provide a way of escape also so that you'll be able to do it. Good job. All right. You guys just got five points. So you're at 76 now. All right. Okay. Let's keep moving. Um, all right. So, uh, Mark 4, um, a lot of like themes of discipleship. Uh, Mark 5, a lot of themes of like miracles. And I want to say compassion, Jesus' compassion. Okay. So we're going to cover three different kinds of miracles today, I guess. Um, the first one, Jesus is going to cast out this legion of demons from this poor, poor, poor man. Um, the second one, he's going to heal, resurrect, actually, Jairus' daughter. And then the third one, he's going to heal this woman who has had uh, this bleeding for 12 years. Okay. So uh, at the forefront of this, I think we're going to see Jesus' compassion come through in his ministry of healing and his ministry of service uh, and, and the suffering servant that he is. Um, and there's a lot of other themes, but uh, just, just calling that out, um, what he kind of unifies chapter five. Um, and chapter six, next time is going to be, I think, one of the longest chapters. So I uh, got a lot, of, a lot of things to cover. Let me close you guys out. Um, okay, so they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. 
Okay, so um, just, just a quick note about the uh, location of these things. So going back to our where Jesus walked then kind of figure. Um, so you can see he was in Capernaum on the east side, of, or sorry, the west side of the Sea of Galilee. Um, and then he's going to now the other side. Um, sorry, uh, to the other side of the sea, to the country of Gerasenes. Um, and he meets this guy and then he's going to go back and forth kind of. Um, so we'll see him kind of go back and forth. Um, and then, uh, okay, so yes, and when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarene, Gadarene, Gadarenes, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tomb so fierce that no one could pass that way. Um, Matthew mentions two, uh, Mark only mentions one. It's not incongruent, it's just a different point of view and different things that they decide to focus on. Um, but they, these guys were in where they were, right? They knew that these demon possessed men were there. Right? They knew, like, oh, those are the tombs where the demon possessed men are. Like, let's not go that way because they're scary. Um, and so that's that's kind of the, the historical context, the geographical context, if you will. Um, and so let's take a look at this man, right? He says, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. Uh, no one could bind him, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he rents the chains apart broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Um, okay, so th this guy is, is a little bit different from the other demon-possessed men uh, that we've seen. If you go back to, I believe, Mark 1, there's a demon-possessed man in the synagogue. Uh, I don't think you would find this guy in the synagogue, right? He's not a very, like, civilized. He's, like, really, you know, um, it, this is, like, the stuff of horror movies, right? Uh, I, I looked it up earlier today. There's actually a horror movie called Legion. Um, not really similar to this gospel story, um, in fact. But uh, yeah, this is like the stuff you find in horror movies, right? This guy's like, you know, destroying his own body. Um, they bound him up. He, he tries, he, he, there, no one can bind him because he breaks them. Um, and even more than that, right? Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Um, so this is a tormented man. Right? This is a constant torment, right? Night and day, it says, among the tombs and on the mountains. So he's alone, right? Not only is he alone, but he's hurting himself. Not only does he hurt himself, but he's often bound, right? Uh, not only is he bound, but he's often like crying out and cutting himself with stones. And if this description doesn't evoke the compassion in you, um, I'm going to stop there. But like this is this is a very poor tormented man um, and, and says, let's see what Jesus does, right? And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. Okay, so uh, likely this is kind of the, the demons uh, controlling this man and falling down before Jesus. Um, yeah, because in verse seven, it says, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me? Um, okay, so there's a few things to note about, I'm going to just say the demons here, even though they're technically the unclean spirit in the man, but there's a few things to know about the demons. Um, one, they prostrate themselves before Jesus, right? Jesus is their authority, um, and even the demons bow down before him, right? Um, so they, they go and they prostrate themselves in humility. Uh, I wouldn't really call it humility, but maybe, you know, colloquial speaking, colloquially speaking, we would say humility. Um, and what do we know about their theology, okay? Okay. Uh, Frankly speaking, I think the demons have much better theology than we do. Um, so they say, Jesus, son of the most high God. Wow. Like no one really says that until Mark 8, right? Mark 10, Mark 11, Mark 8, so and so on and so forth, right? Um, but here, the, Jesus, uh, the demons, and they've said this before, right? Jesus, son of the most high God. It's not just like Jesus, son of God. It's not just Jesus, son of man. It's like Jesus, son of the most high God. Like they're theology of who this guy is is more precise accurate and clear than anyone that we've seen so far right um and that that's that's pretty crazy um and then what do they say what have you to do with me okay so so they they know something about the, the historical times and the future times right they have a distinction here between the first coming and the second coming um and this is a theology of the prophets you can look at like hebrews one you can look at um like different, like first Peter uh, or second Peter, I forgot which one, sorry. Um, but basically like the prophets searched the scriptures so that they would know the timing and when the Christ would come, right? And they prophesied about him. But even the prophets, they had this, if you guys had heard like the mountains and the valley analogy, like 
if the mountains represent the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ, and they're just viewing it, they see two mountain peaks and they don't know how far away they are, right? Because they don't see the valleys in between. Um, and so that was kind of the view of the prophets. If you go back into the Old Testament, look at like Isaiah, look at Jeremiah, look at all these Old Testament prophets, it's kind of like mixed um, where they have like first coming stuff, they have second coming stuff and it's like unclear. Um, and uh, th there is like, yeah, some details about the timing of things and like the tribulation period and stuff like that. But, but basically, uh, even the prophets are unsure. Um, and yet the demons here, they're like, what have you to do to me, do with me? Because basically it's not the time right now, right? Like Jesus, what are you doing here? Uh, it's not the second coming. Don't torment me yet or don't throw me into the lake of fire, right? Um, and so they're asking Jesus, like, what are you going to do to me? Because it's not the second coming, but you're here and I'm expecting something. Um, and so their theology of the, the end times is, is rather uh, well-defined. Um, and then I dare you by God, do not torment me. Okay, so uh, the demons will end up in the lake of fire. I think I have it here, yeah. Uh, with death, Hades, uh, the devil, um, Revelation 20, 14 to 15. Anyone whose name is not written, I'll just read it. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Um, uh, elsewhere, I think probably prior to these verses, it says that the devil, the enemy, Satan, will be cast into the lake of fire, uh, presumably the demons with him as his underlings, right? So uh, they, they know their end, um, and they know kind of the torment that is coming. And so they're during God, Jesus, right? Jesus is God. Even here, you can see the Trinitarian kind of theology, right? I adjure you by God. Um, Jesus, son of the most high God. Okay. Uh, do not torment me. Um, so kind of, you know, uh, it's not the time. Um, and so uh, I think uh, it's, I don't have it here. Um, can anyone pull up? I think it's James 2.19. Um, is that it? Um, let me make sure I have the rest of the right. Yeah. Uh, Tonight, okay, cool. We believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shut it. Yeah, so um, I should have put it in here, but even the demons believe uh, in a God, right? Even the demons believe in the right God. Even the demons believe, and they have better theology than we do, um, but they don't worship him. And they don't worship him. That, that's the difference, right? Um, they understand, they have knowledge about God. They have better knowledge than many of our seminarian trained people. Um, and yet they don't worship God. They don't love God. And so they will end up in the lake of fire. Um, and so I think the warning for us is that knowledge does not save us. Knowledge alone, um, even though we are to be growing in the knowledge of our Savior. Uh, but ultimately, it is our worship um, that that will define uh, our eternal uh, fate, right? Do we worship Lord, our God as our Lord and Savior? Do we worship Christ, um, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit? Um, okay. Uh, and he says, um, so Jesus tells them to come out, and he says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Okay, so uh, the Legion, the Roman army, right? Many, many people. Um, it's probably what it's referring to. Uh, there are a lot of demons in this one person, okay? Uh, very unfortunate, again, for this man. Um, okay. Uh, and he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned into, in the sea. Um, okay, so uh, a lot of pigs, unclean spirits go and enter into them. Uh, but the key thing I think to note here is that Jesus gave them permission. Okay, so Jesus has the authority of the Son of God. Even the demons have to obey him, right? Um, and even what they are doing in today's world is within the perfect will and constraints of God. So we can see a picture of this in Job 1.12. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Um, 
And so uh, in the beginning of Job, we see Satan going into, you know, um, kind of a courtroom, I guess, with the Lord, uh, telling him about this man. The Lord is telling Satan about Job, and Satan's like accusing Job, basically. And the Lord gives him permission to take everything that is in his hand. So Job loses his family, and Job loses his uh, livelihood, uh, basically everything around him. Um, but he does not die. Okay, so even here, God restrains Satan, and Satan can only do what the Lord allows. Um, and ultimately, it is for um, it is for God's purpose. Okay, uh, so in the book of Job, right, Job is eventually restored. God is glorified. Uh, a lot of wisdom to glean from that. Uh, here, um, this is ultimately for God's purposes as well. Um, and so, uh, so we see, like, even for, for Christ, uh, it's not like he has to say some incantation. Um, he doesn't have to say, in Jesus' name, go. <laughs> he just says, Matthew 32, and he said to them, go. Um, so that by, by the power of his word, right, he's able to destroy the works of the devil, and that is what he came for. First John 3, 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So uh, I'm not equating those two things here. It's not like this is his mission to go and cast out demons. But uh, this is just like one example, uh, one picture of the ways that Jesus is destroying the works of the devil. Um, he's freeing this man. He's saving this man uh, from the unclean spirits um, by the power of his word alone. Um, okay. Uh, Jesus leaves the area of the grass means. Um, right, so what happens next? The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to see Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the, had the legion sitting there, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Um, Okay, so herdsmen flee and people come to see what has happened. Okay, so clearly something has happened here. Uh, I don't think they're going to deny that fact. And it draws the attention and surprise of the people and the herdsmen. Everyone's coming. This is kind of the scene that's set up. Um, and what happens to this demon-possessed man? Uh, three things, right? Threefold change. He's sitting there. Uh, remember, night and day, he was crying out and cutting himself. And now he's just sitting there. Boom, that, that's a huge shift. Um, he's clothed uh, as opposed to presumably being naked, um, right? Uh, and then he's, he's in his right mind as opposed to being utterly oppressed by demons. So a huge change in this guy. Um, and what does it say? How do they react, right? They were afraid. Um, okay, I should have golden that phrase right there at the end of 15, but they were afraid. Okay? And then they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Um, so I think the important thing, if we can park here for a little bit, is that um, when we see the works of God, and this is going to be a theme throughout this chapter as well, uh, there's awe, there's fear, right? When we see general revelation, again, when we see the creative powers of God, um, we are afraid. And, I, and, and we covered this, I think, back when Jesus calmed the storm, right? The, the natural response to the holiness of God is fear. Um, and that, that's pretty much what people are doing here. But but th this is a response of fear that ultimately doesn't lead to repentance. Okay? So they didn't, they weren't afraid and they're like, who are you? And they like get to know Jesus, right? They, instead, they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Um, and we can speculate it's because like, oh, they cared about the pigs and their herdsmen, but um, I'm not going to quite go there. Uh, but I think I will draw out the point that it's not just the evidence Okay, it's not just the evidence, it's the faith response. Um, and there's an evangelistic principle for us, right? Because people came to see what it was that happened, right? They're not denying that something happened. Clearly, like they believe the word of the herdsman, like the pigs are gone, right? They see this guy completely changed. And yet they're not like, oh, wow, this is a son of God who I need to worship and repent before. They're like, no, Jesus, please leave us. Um, it's not a lack of evidence. Um, and so, uh, and it's not to say that apologetics is worthless, right? Uh, but apologetics is not the, the ultimate thing, right? It's not, it's not what's going to save people, right? You can 
apologize all you want and to the end times, but if, if, if the Holy Spirit is not moving in the person's heart, if God is not the one causing them to repent, uh, then they will not come to faith. Um, it's an opening of the eyes. It's, 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 it's really God's work in bringing people to repentance. Um, and uh, yeah, again, not to say that we shouldn't try to explain things clearly. It's not to say that we shouldn't try to explain the scriptures. I think those are wonderful tools uh, and, and wonderful tools of grace to bring people to God. Uh, but ultimately, it is God who saves, right? not our eloquent words or our gospel presentations. Um, so uh, it's a fine line to walk, right? These things are good. These things are important, right? Presenting people evidence from the scriptures, presenting people evidence from your life, presenting people evidence from, uh, you know, extra biblical sources. Um, but ultimately, uh, it, it comes down to faith. Um, okay. Um, and, and I wish uh, I'd put these on the same page, actually. Um, but this is like a... This is a beautiful, literally, like way that, that Mark put it. Um, so you see it in verse 18. And as he, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And they began to beg Jesus. The man who had been possessed with demons begged him. And they began to beg Jesus. These are the same words in the Greek. Uh, okay. Um, the, the phrase that they use, that Mark uses here, it's the same. Um, and so you see the juxtaposition of the faithless who are begging Jesus to depart after seeing his, his miracle, his works. And then you see this man who was saved from so much, right? Uh, loneliness, pain, you know, sorrow, all these things. Uh, and then he begs him that he might be with him. Um, so completely opposite responses, right? Um, from, from faithless people who may not understand who Christ is to someone who truly understands what he has been given. Um, by God, how he's been saved by the Lord. Um, he begs him that he might be with him. Um, and, and so uh, going back, uh, you see that another evangelistic principle, Jesus responds to the people and he respects the response. Okay. So verse 17, they beg him to leave. And verse 18, he gets into the boat. Um, he doesn't like, he respects kind of their hard hardness. Um, and uh, this, this kind of like goes back into the principle of like, oh, why, why is Jesus starting to speak in parables, right? It's to match the hard hardness of the people, right? Um, I, I like to think of it, uh, this is me speculating, so take this with a grain of salt, I, you know, um, sanctified speculation, if you will, but I like to think parables are a little bit more interesting. So people who have rejected the truth and they don't really understand, parables is kind of like the last effort where like, oh, they're still willing to listen. Let me try to give them some truth. So they, you know, um, I, I won't, I won't belabor the point. Uh, but basically, right, he respects their decision to reject him. Um, and I think just like personally, um, it, it's, it's a hard thing to do in practical ministry, because I think like the right compassionate heart of heart response is like, oh, I want to do everything I can to convince you to follow Christ because I know that that's the best thing for you, right? That, that brings glory to my Lord and that's the best thing for you. Um, so I'm gonna fight tooth and nail. And even if you're mean to me, if you reject me, like I'm gonna try to do all I can to convince you, right? Um, and yet there is wisdom in the other direction, right? Don't throw the pearls before the swine. You know, if they reject you, like wipe off the dust off your feet. And there are times when you just have to wait for the Lord um, and wait on the Lord and trust this person to the Lord and, um, and be like, okay, uh, maybe now is not the right time. I pray that the Lord will humble you. And maybe in the future, um, you know, someone else will share the gospel with you or I will share, or, you know, you know, the Lord will bring these things to your mind. Um, and oftentimes we just have to respect their decision. Right. Uh, I, I could speak much more about that, but, um, we're running out of time. So let's keep moving. Um, and th this is like a beautiful picture of discipleship, right? This man who has literally just been like literally saved. Um, I mean, spiritually and like physically, right? He begs Jesus that he might be with him. Um, and, and I would garner to think that uh, I wish this were a response in the American Christian, not just American Christian church, but uh, that's just where we are culturally. Uh, the Christian church today, right? That we would 
beg to be with Christ, that this would be our heart to be with Christ. Um, but I think often it's like, you know, Jesus has to drag us out of our bed to go to church on Sundays or things like that, right? Is that, is that the same picture as we see the picture of discipleship presented in the Gospels? Um, and just, just an exhortation there. But, um, okay, and he says, he does not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Okay, so Jesus says, no, you can't be with me, but you're going to be my missionary. Okay, so this is, this is one of the first, like, missionaries, and he goes to the Decapolis. Oh, I didn't highlight that there. Uh, the Decapolis, uh, let me see if I can go all the way back real quickly. Okay, so Decapolis right here. Uh, so this guy's going from, like, the other side of the sea down to the Decapolis where he, he lives, I guess. Um, and this is primarily Gentile territory. Okay, so... Uh, not a lot of Jews in the Decapolis, uh, but he sends them here. He sends him back there. Um, and he says, tell them, tell them what? Tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has mercy on you. So he sends them with a specific message to tell them about God's grace, right? God's mercy, um, God's forgiveness, God's help, uh, everything the Lord has done for him. Um, and what is the response? Right? And he went away. So this guy was obedient. He went away, began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. And that's like a three words. It's like, it's such a beautiful picture of what like evangelism is supposed to be like, right? Uh, we go, he, he calls us to go. Uh, we go, we proclaim the good news and everyone marvels, right? What? Like, um, uh, I'm at a loss for words. I, I'm marveling. Um, but yeah, like God is glorified, right? God is glorified through this man's obedience. God is glorified by his proclamation of what God has done for him. Um, and yeah, this, this guy doesn't, I don't know, he's like, he's not with Jesus for three years, but he knows how much the Lord has done for him and he can share that. Um, and so I, I think the encouragement uh, here maybe, or one encouragement is like, yeah, you don't have to have, a degree in these things and you don't have to have all the answers but if you can share how much the lord has done for you uh if you can reflect on that and if you can share how he has had mercy on you um that's enough here to make everyone marvel right because ultimately it's, it's the lord's work um all right next section the appeal of gyrus um okay question one how many pigs did legion enter into just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, this is the real question one. What two things did Jesus tell the missionary to report? All right. Um, so uh, I'm running a little bit short on time. Maybe on the second page of the notes. Uh, the overview of the next two encounters. Um, narratively, it's split up in a funny way, where we have Jairus and then the woman and then another Jairus. Um, and I think it's done that way specifically to highlight kind of the, the tension. Um, but uh, the overview of the next two encounters is that it, they both deal with the difficulty of living in a sin-cursed world. Um, okay, so Jairus' daughter is sick, right? Sickness, death uh, comes as a result of the curse. Um, this woman has been bleeding for 12 years, uh, 12 years, um, also an effect of the sin-cursed world, right? Um, and so Romans 8.22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Um, I don't think we can live life on this side of eternity, uh, escaping suffering. Um, and, and it's just a matter of fact, like, uh, we will suffer uh, because of our own sin. We will suffer because of the sins of other people. Um, we will suffer because of just, yeah, the sin of the world. Um, 
the pains of childbirth. Uh, so there's a lot of suffering in this world. Um, and the, the picture of faith that is shown in these two people is the humility of heart, the okay? humility of a broken spirit, Psalm 51, 17. This is a picture that is shown by these two disciples. Um, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite broken and contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise. Um, okay, so true worship, true sacrifices, right? the humble, broken spirit, a spirit that knows that they need desperately um, a Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, um, God himself. Okay. Um, and when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, I like that, yeah, a great crowd gathered about him, he was beside the sea. Okay, so Jesus is like, the picture that's presented here in Mark is Jesus just playing ping pong, right? He's going, he's going here, and then he goes there, and then he's, he like teaches all day here. He goes to the other side, he frees this demon possessed man, and he goes again to the other side, and there's another great crowd. But you really feel like the pressure, right? You really feel the immediacy and the urgency, and um, you really feel the picture of the suffering servant. Like this guy has like no time to rest or sleep. It's just like doing ministry, teaching, like ministry, healing, and, and like an, another great crowd. Um, and I'm sure in his humanity, he did have time to rest and sleep. But the picture that Mark paints us here is it's like Jesus is always working. Right? Jesus is always serving. Um, and so then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. Um, okay, so he's a ruler of the synagogue. Uh, go back to Mark 3, 6. Um, synagogue is the place of religious worship. It's where all the Jews do their... Um, uh, you know, a church service, if you will, uh, going back historically, uh, where they would sit at the rabbi and the rabbi would teach, um, so on and so forth, do other religious things. Um, and so Jairus being one of the rulers of the synagogue would be very well entrenched into the Jewish culture and the Jewish religion. Um, and so to come to Jesus Christ, who, if, if you remember from the first four chapters of Mark, uh, these Pharisees and Sadducees and, you know, Herodians are already plotting to kill him. Okay, so if you're a ruler of the synagogue and you're going to him, um, that makes you an outcast. Okay, so this is like not an easy thing for this guy to do. Um, but you see that his request comes in humility and love, right? He, he himself, like we've seen before, like with Matt, Levi, Matthew, uh, like, you know, Peter and Andrew, James and John, uh, so many other disciples, he's giving up a lot to come to Christ um, because he, he desperately needs help, right? Because of his love for his daughter. Um, so he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, uh, um, saying, my little daughter. Okay, a lot of details here that are just pointing at this guy's de 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 dependency, right? His desperation. Um he falls at his feet, similar picture as the demons, right? Prostration, humility, and for him earnestly, right? Saying, my little daughter, right? He must love his daughter very much um, by the phrase there. Okay? Um, is at the point of death, come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. Uh, okay, so in the synoptic gospels, uh, there's no words that Jesus says that's recorded. Jesus just goes with this guy. Um, and I, I think it's an act of compassion. Like he understands the situation. He's like, um, he understands this man's sorrow and pain and anxiety. And he just goes with him. Um, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. But uh, you see in contrast to what the great crowd does. Okay, so this, this word for thronged, uh, sunthlebo, uh, it's like a very strong, like, you know, like it's not like, oh, like let me make a way for you so you can come and heal this ruler's daughter, it's like, let me get my hands on this guy to get some healing or something. It's like, um, you know, it, it almost seems like a very selfish reaction where they're like not understanding what Jesus is trying to do. And they're just trying to like grab at him and get the, the miracles. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the word, it's quite a strong word. Um, and so right in the midst of this narrative, right, he's gone with him. Uh, presumably he's going to heal the daughter. We have this interruption. Um, of the woman who had the discharge. Uh, question two, how would you feel in Jairus' shoes being interrupted?
All right. Um, so there's a lot going on here. Uh, and I think, I mean, I don't know how long this little interruption took, uh, but I think it's like presented in this way to help us feel that tension of like, ah, uh, like, is he going to heal, heal the girl? Um, but I think there's a lot going on. Like one of them is just his compassion, right? He's willing to be interrupted by this woman. He has a task to do, and yet he knows the needs of this woman. Um, and you see, he goes like above and beyond. He's just not, he's not just like, oh, let me heal you and keep going. Um, he takes the time to, to talk with this woman and to walk with this woman. Um, and you also see Jairus is waiting. Uh, so I don't know about you. I would be very, very distressed if my little boy was dying and I knew the guy who could help him and someone just interrupted me and I would be like, uh, when is this going to be over? Like, can we go? Um, and we also see like God's perfect timing. Right. So, um, we know we are blessed to know what happens in the end. Um, and ultimately it is for God's glory. Right. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there's another example in Lazarus's death. Um, and they're like, oh, you know, if he had been here earlier, right, my brother wouldn't have died. Um, but it's for God's glory to resurrect him, right? What's more glorious to see someone healed or to see someone literally brought back from life? Um, and so we see even in this, like God's wisdom is perfect. His timing is perfect, right? Uh, there's so many moving pieces, right? Don't forget about the crowd, but uh, the response is perfect for everyone involved, right? Um, the woman, uh, Jairus, right? The daughter, uh, everyone is, is brought towards God. Um, and so uh, this unnamed woman, and there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Um, okay, so... Um, I wish I could do a better job explaining how much these people are suffering in, in, um, in this chapter. Uh, like we just kind of glossed over the fact that night and day, that guy was tormented for however long, but if I don't sleep for a day or two, uh, even with kids, like maybe a month, um, or three months, right. It's, it's terrible. Uh, let me tell you, uh, I could go on and on, but, um, uh, it's terrible. Um, and for this woman to have a discharge of blood for 12 years, uh, I can't imagine the kind of pain she must have been going through. Um, and even worse than that, right? It's way made even worse in their society, right? Um, Leviticus 15, 19, when a woman has a discharge and a discharge in her body is blood, she shall be in her menstrual impurity for seven days and whoever touches her shall be unclean until the evening. So clean and unclean, very, very forefront of their minds. For this woman, she is unclean for 12 years. That means she's cast out, right? She can't take part in religious services. She can't go to the synagogue. She can't offer sacrifice. She can't do this and that. Everyone tries to avoid her because they don't want to be ceremoniously unclean themselves, right? Imagine the kind of loneliness, the pain, not only from the physical pain, but like being literally separated from society um, for 12 years like that. Yeah, I, I just, I wish I could do a better job of just, I don't know, explaining this, but... Um, yeah, this is, this is this is a lot. And if that's not enough, right, it's explicitly said in verse 26, who had suffered much under many physicians, had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. Oh, this is this is really, this is immense suffering. Um, and like, I, I see a little bit of this because uh, Olivia's never slept well. So we go to a lot of physicians. Um, and, and not quite to this extent, and they are helpful. Um, but even that is like immense suffering. Um, and I see that every day. Uh, and yet for this woman, um, right, she went to many physicians, she spent all that she had, and she wasn't even the same, she was worse off for it. Um, like, yeah, I, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's immense suffering. Um, and so she had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd. And touched his garment, for she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Um, okay, so this this touching his garment um, is an act of great faith with great risk, actually, because coming, like, there's a huge crowd about him, right? So if she's coming up, and they know she's unclean, 
that would have significant repercussions for her, right? She's an unclean person, like touching all these people, right? Um, and she's just trying to get to Jesus. Uh, but, right, she risks defiling crowds. She risks drawing attention to herself, right? She risks, like, all these things. Um, and why does she risk it? Right, because she believes that if she touches, even just touches his garments, she would be made well. Um, and so here, here's a clear depiction of faith motivating action. Okay, she has a theology that this guy is going to heal her and he has the power to heal her, right? Um, that motivates her action to risk going through the crowds to touch him. And okay? so theology motivates actions. Same with Jairus, right? Um, but it's a wrong belief, right? Jesus can just say the word and she'll be healed. Jesus can say the word and Jairus' daughter will be resurrected. Um, she doesn't need to touch his garments, right? But it's probably a belief uh, in what has been revealed in his ministry. Um, probably stories of him like laying hands on people and then being healed. Um, and so she believes what has been revealed and her faith motivates her actions. Um, so for us, right? Oh, did I have it here? Oh, no, I don't. Um, can someone go to Colossians 1, 9 to 12? Can you read that for us, please? Uh, one, nine to twelve. Thank you. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all the with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the and the inheritance of the saints in, in Man, Thank you. Um, so knowledge is, is mentioned twice in those three verses, right? Um, and how do we work, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord? By knowledge of his will, right? Spiritual understanding. Um, and so what we know about God affects how we live. So theology affects how we, how we act, right? Same for this woman, same for us, right? Um, she had an incomplete theology. Uh, we have incomplete theologies. But as we study the scriptures, as we train our minds to think biblically and have build that biblical worldview, we will start to have a better and clearer picture of who God is. Um, and that will drive our living and our actions. Uh, so that's the way that, that it works. Um, scriptures, and you can see that here. Uh, and immediately the flow of blood dried up. Wow, praise the Lord. She was immediately uh, healed. Right? And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. So she felt it. Um, uh, I think I'm running a little low on time, so I'm going to keep moving. Um, okay, so, and Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Um, uh, this, is so, this, is, <laughs> this is such a, like a compassionate response. Jesus is, is um, yeah, beautiful Lord and Savior. Um, so let, let's unpack a little bit of this. Um, so first he perceived in himself that power had gone out from him. Okay? So God is not an impersonal God. And you can even see it depicted here, right? It's not like Jesus is like, boom, heal, boom, heal. Uh, but he perceives in himself that power had gone out. Like he has an intimate connection with his creation, um, right? He who created the world. Um, and so uh, I don't want to like have a strong extrapolation and be like, yeah, but um, God is connected to his people, right? God is, is a personal God um, and he hears you when you pray to him. Um, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? Uh, okay, so number two, Jesus is dissatisfied with the woman being healed in secret. Okay, so he's not just like, okay, this woman is healed. Let me move on to heal Jairus' daughter. Um, he stops. He turns around and says, who touched my garments? Um, okay, so the question, who touched my garments, is not out of ignorance, right? 
uh, clearly if he, you know, Jesus as the son of God um, knows, uh, but it's, it's one of drawing towards himself. Right? He knows the hearts of man, and yet he wanted to draw this woman to himself. He wanted to have this personal encounter with this woman. Um, and you look at disciples, they're still living by sight, right? You see the crowd pressing around. There's so many people, like, how can you tell who touched you, right? Um, right? So they're still looking with their eyes, and they're like, oh, there's so many people. They don't understand Jesus' um, heart or his kind of uh, his actions here. Um, and this woman came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. So, again, our, our theme of kind of fear right? Um, so you see God, you see his power, you see his healing, you see the awesome might, and you see who God truly is, his holiness, his like separation, um, and you're afraid. Uh, and this woman's afraid. Um, and yet, uh, it is like a reverential fear, right? It's not the fear of, of the people where like they beg Jesus to leave. Um, but instead, here we see that she comes to Christ, right? She falls down before him and she confesses. Right. Rather than the, than the temptation to lie, right, she confesses the whole truth. She tells the whole truth. Um, this is a beautiful picture of faith. Um, and he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Uh, in other translations, it can be your faith has saved you. Um, go in peace and be healed of your disease. Um, okay, so this is Jesus' affirmation to her. Right, He's not satisfied with being healed in secret. He actually talks to her. And he affirms her, right? So had she left, uh, presumably she might have struggled with, with uh, guilt even, um, thinking that like she stole a blessing, right? Uh, she touches garments, stole power from Christ or something. Um, like she doesn't deserve it, right? Uh, but, but Christ assures her. He says, your faith has made you well, right? Go in peace. Um, and he says, daughter, right? What a, like, what a compassionate word. He's not just like, woman, your faith has made you well. He says, daughter. Um, that's a relational word right there. Um, it says your faith has made you well. So Zoe, again, like has saved you basically. Um, and you're, he's, she's entirely healed. And he says, go in peace and be healed of your disease. Right. Um, I, I think that this is partly for the crowd also to be like, oh, this woman is healed. Uh, she's clean. Right. And so she can, you know, now enter back into society and, and, and um, so on and so forth. Um, Okay, the resurrection of Jairus' daughter, uh, last part, we're coming back to this original narrative of Jairus. Um, while he was still speaking, again, it's just like nonstop, boom, 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 like while he's doing this, while he's doing that, he just, he just goes, um, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. Uh, okay, so here's the interruption of the interruption, um, and it's crushing news, right? No one wants to hear this. Your daughter is dead. Why well, trouble the teacher any further? Like, uh, again, I wish I could convey better how, like, how much suffering these people are are facing um, to to lose your child. Um, yeah, my 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 mom passed away when she was 55. My grandma was is still alive. Um, and one of the things that she said was like, yeah, a child should never die before their parents. Um, and having seen that up front, like, I think I can, I can understand a little bit of this pain. Like, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. Um, death, any death is a terrible thing. Uh, it is a sorrowful thing. And yet to hear that your daughter is dead. Um, yeah. How much, how much more? Um, um and, and notice, uh, why trouble the teacher? Okay, so they say teacher, even though we just saw that Jesus has been casting out demons and healing this and healing that and doing this and doing that, uh, they still call him teacher. Okay, so um, it, again, just another, we've been talking about this theme throughout like one, two, and three and four, right? Um, but Jesus came to share the good news, to bring people into the kingdom of God, not primarily to heal uh, or to cast out demons. Okay. So how was Jairus feeling? Um, I kind of asked that question, how would you feel? Uh, how was he feeling? Uh, we don't have to guess because the scripture tells us here, um, Jesus said, do not fear, only believe. Okay, so again, uh, we see this theme of fear. Uh, this is a little bit of a different type of fear, not a fear of God, uh, just the fear of like, you know, um, you know, my daughter's dead and maybe he, maybe, you know, God can't 
can't save her anymore. Um, that kind of fear. Um, but it, it's interesting to note that the remedy here for this kind of fear is belief. Okay? Um, it's not like comfort. It's not like uh, any anything else. It's belief in God. Um, and so I, I do think this is kind of fear where it's like, it, it's kind of like a doubting fear where you fear like that God is not powerful enough or loving enough to do these things. Um, and the, the counteraction there is to believe in God, uh, to believe in his character, to believe in his power. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah. And okay. And then 37, uh, intimate three. Okay. Peter, James, and John. Um, they go uh, and they enter the house. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion. Uh, sorry, I know we're a little over time. Please forgive me. I'm going to try to finish up. Um, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he entered, he said to them, why are you making commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. <clears throat> but he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Um, Okay, so people weeping and wailing loudly, often what they would do in the Jewish culture at the time was they would hire professional wailers. Um, so the rich families would hire people to come and wail for like and mourn for them, basically. Um, but these people aren't, aren't really like sad, right? You look at verse 40 and they laugh at him, right? Um, they go from like a complete 180. They're like weeping and wailing and they laugh at him. Uh, that's just a picture of lack of faith and hypocrisy, right? They don't believe Jesus, and Jesus is saying, like, they're not dead, but he, the child is not dead, but sleeping. Um, and they're like, ha, 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 like, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and you just see the hypocrisy, right? Um, I don't have the verse in Joel here, but, like, yeah, this this kind of fake mourning, right? Um, this is a theme in the scriptures, right? This, this fake, it's, it's not a real heart, uh, heart thing. Um, and then uh, he put them all outside. Okay, so... <laughs> Uh, be gone, uh, you fake whalers uh, and hypocrites. Um, and then he goes in. Uh, taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, kumai, kum, kum, uh, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. Uh, and immediately the girl got up and began walking. She was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. Um, and he strictly charged them that no one should know this. And he told them to give her something to eat. So a few, few details here again. Um, this Talitha Kumai is, is Aramaic. Uh, so Mark translates it here for the Greek audience, uh, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. So again, he's writing in the Greek, we have an English. Um, uh, and then um, he removes the crowd, right? Uh, so it's just them, uh, kind of just the ones who, who believe, uh, who are able to see and witness these miracles. Um, and then what happens to them, right? Again, they're overcome with amazement. Uh, you see the works of God and you are amazed. Um, and yeah, I, I, I um, uh, okay, I, I'll save that comment. Um, told them to give her something to eat. Last thing, uh, Jesus really cares about personal needs. Right? We can see that here, right? Uh, the first thing that they tell, that he tells them to do is give her something to eat because she's a little girl and he knows she has physical needs and he doesn't forget that, right? I think this is just an amazing little detail of Jesus' compassion and care for people, right? Um, he's not just like, oh, I resurrected you. Let me leave now. It's like, no, she needs something to eat. Um, and I care for this little girl. Um, and so, yeah, just just the whole, whole picture of Jesus' compassion throughout all these miracles and the way that he loves people. Um, and it's my prayer that uh, I and we and we all as, as a church could love people as, as Jesus does. Um, okay. Um, so the homework is um, to add to this spreadsheet. Uh, okay, so this is the unlimited uh, opportunity for points that I alluded to earlier. Okay, um, so uh, in in kind of talking about some of the themes of like fear um, and yet coming to Christ that we've seen in these kind of miracles here, um, I wanted us to collectively as a class collect. Uh, some verses about God's holiness, which should put a fear in our hearts, right? Uh, and yet God's love, which perfect love casts out all fear, right? So I want us to juxtapose these things. And then next week, we'll just kind of read through some of them, depending on how many you guys collect. Um, and hopefully that will invigorate our hearts to have a right view of God um, and to see 
see his holiness and character as it truly is and to see how much he condescended in love for us. Um, okay, so uh, you get one point for each verse reference on either side. Um, so you can imagine there could be a lot. Um, and it doesn't have to have the words like holiness and love, right? All of the scripture actually speaks about these two aspects um, in some shape or form, right? <laughs> Uh, but don't go putting all of the scripture references, please. Uh, be realistic. Um, Do you want us to put the text in? No, no text. Just just verse references. Um, yeah. So uh, feel free to fill that out. Um, again, you guys need probably like 20, 30 points for rewards one and two. Um, if you guys don't flunk the rest of the quizzes, so this is the opportunity to kind of like get ahead of that a little bit. Um, uh, so yeah, um, that is the homework. Um, and then I have one last question for you guys. Um, okay. What is one area where your compassion can look more like Christ? Um, let me pray for us. You guys need a little bit more time. You can keep writing. Um, Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for who you are. Um, that you are a loving God and Savior who is not an impersonal God who just created a world and left it to its own devices, but you have entered into it um, as a son of man. And you show such great compassion to your people. Um, I pray that we may be more like you each and every day that our hearts would be tender hearted, that our hearts would be moved by all the suffering we see around us, um, that we would love to point people back to you, that we would love to help encourage and even admonish as it brings people to see you more clearly. Um, I pray that you would help us to speak in love and wisdom and in truth, uh, that you would just yeah mold us into your image as we are transformed from one degree of glory to the next. Uh, I pray you just, for the sanctification of our class, for the mutual encouragement. Uh, I thank you for all the efforts and the heart and people being present and paying attention and doing the homework and, and everything. Um, I pray that you, uh, yeah, would just bless us as we seek to follow and honor you and that we would bring you glory in all that we do. Um, in Jesus' name I would pray. Amen. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to leave the recording on if there are any questions. Uh, happy to try to answer any of them. I want to go back to stop share. Stop share. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> All right. Well, if there are no questions, I will end this recording then. Stop cloud recording.